morning and welcome to uh, Legislature's Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning we have with us Billy Coster from the Agency of Natural Resources. <clears throat> welcome, Mr. Coster. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh. For the record, I'm Billy Coster. I'm the Director of Planning for the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, I believe uh, you asked me to come in to speak to Green Mountain Power's proposal uh, to seek a time-bound exemption for certain resilience projects from FTP. Um, I thought I would just give a little bit of background on ANR's role in the Active 50 process since it's the proposal. Um, so one of my responsibilities as the planning director for the agency is to manage the agency's participation in Act 250. Um, we are not the decision maker in the Act 250 process. Act 250 is administered by the Natural Resources Board and Act 50 permits are issued by uh, regional district commissions. ANR is a party in that process. Uh, we appear like the applicant or vendors or other folks who um, have a vested interest in the project. And we provide evidence and recommendations to district commissions on how we believe they should find on the um, We do that in two primary ways. Uh, one is through the issuance of, of permits, primarily through our Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and many of those permits can be used as rebuttable presumptions to prove compliance with Act 250's criteria. So uh, in many cases, if someone obtains a wetlands pro permit or a stormwater permit from our agency, they can use that in Act 250 to show they've met that criteria. Um, the other main way that we participate is in providing substantive testimony under criteria that don't have other permits, that Act 250 is really the only place that provides statewide regulatory oversight um, and those areas are primarily focused on uh, fish and wildlife habitat and floodways issues. So necessary wildlife habitat, uh, rare and irreplaceable natural communities, floodways and river corridors, and riparian area protection under the streams criteria. So these are, um, these are resources that, that generally do not have other state permits associated with them and that we and others rely on Act 250. Can you say those three, those again, the sure, phrase it's, with um, the permits? Criteria 8 and 8A, which usually are necessary wildlife habitat and rare and irreplaceable natural communities, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, criteria 1E, which is the streams criteria, where we look at uh, protecting riparian areas to maintain the natural condition of the stream. And then uh, criteria 1F, which is the floodways criteria, which, is a, which addresses floodplain and river water protection. Thank you. And then, actually, since I'm... Just interrupt you. Can you tell us a rebuttable presumption? What does that mean? So there is this. So I'm not a lawyer, but I'll do my best here. I think that the basic construct is that if you obtain one of these permits, there's a reasonable expectation that you've met the Act 250 criteria. And then the burden is on other parties to rebut that assumption and, and say that you have it. So if I'm, a, if I'm a developer and I get a wetlands permit, I go into Act 250 and say, this permit proves or, or basically means I've met my burden under Act 250 and someone else has to prove otherwise. And otherwise that permit carries the day. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, Senator Smith. Thank you. So if there is an abutter that wants to argue that point, that they can pursue the issue? Uh, typically, yes. Yeah, they need to first have party status before the district commission, and then they okay. can bring evidence why the permit is not sufficient to address the criteria. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, so we, we, we engage around Act 250 through those two main ways. We participate in um, hearings for major projects and provide written comments for minor projects. Uh, my office receives all Act 250 major minor permits from uh, the NRB, and we circulate that to over 100 technical staff in all three of our departments. And then we coordinate uh, their review of that work. We take their comments and suggested permit conditions, and then we synthesize those into a single position uh, representing the agency and share that with Act 250 and the applicant. We also do a tremendous amount of work uh, before the formal 250 process even starts. We provide guidance and technical assistance and um, issue scoping for applicants if they're interested. If you're 
um, interested in doing a, a major development that you know will require an Act 250 permit, uh, you're invited to come and meet with my team and others to talk through your proposal. We'll try to help identify what resources are present at the site, what potential impacts uh, the project may pose, and, and ways to resolve those with the goal that by the time you file your Act 250 application, all environmental issues from our perspective are resolved. Um, we're not always successful in that, but that is something we strive for because it's it's a best practice to try to do that work in advance. Um, so we we really appreciate the value in Act 250 um, that it has for Vermonters for natural resource protection, especially around those criteria that aren't satisfied by other um, permits. We also appreciate turning to the Green Mountain Powers proposal, the real need and value in resilience projects. Um, you know, we've known for decades now that the climate is changing in ways that um, make it more severe, put um, these overground resources at risk, especially in uh, cross-country locations. We know that as we rely uh, more increasingly on electricity to heat our homes and power our appliances and our cars, that uh, you know, electricity is, is more and more of an essential service. Uh, so we're, we're certainly appreciative and sympathetic to the need to move these projects forward. Um, as I think you heard from the Natural Resources Board last week, you know, we have talked with them, we've talked with GMP. We do believe there are some real options within the existing legal framework to uh, expedite these projects. There's opportunities to um, address uh, individual landowners who may not be willing to sign off on Act 250 applications to still move those projects forward in a phased way or to potentially waive um, those requirements. And I know the NRB spoke to that. And I encourage you to speak with them more if you've got questions there. Um, and we, we do believe that Act 250 review adds value to these projects, to distribution line projects. Um, I did look back at um, a number of recent Act 250 cases involving Green Mountain Power distribution lines that took you know, a longer period of time. In those cases, the, the environmental issues were fairly minimal. Um, you know, it didn't seem like our work in the Act 250 process was uh, contributing greatly to the delay. I know that likely there was a lot of work done by Green Mountain Power with our folks in advance of filing their applications that positioned them well to um, not have a lot of environmental issues uh, in, in that process. Um, but, you know, we still see that there's value there. Um, you know, we also acknowledge that the NRB is undertaking a study right now and is going to deliver back to the legislature uh, at the start of the next session. Uh, what I hope to be a, a comprehensive set of recommendations to modernize Act 250, looking at jurisdiction criteria and, and this sort of update to, uh, you know, better align uh, Act 250 distribution line projects with the need and the reality seems you know, perfect subject matter for that work. And I do appreciate Green Mountain Power's inclusion of, of that specific point um, in their proposal. Um, so, you know, summarize Act 250 has value for natural resource protection for these projects. Many of them are running through river, river, valley, river valleys along roadways where we do have uh, potential floodway and corridor issues, potential natural issues. Um, so we would, you know, rather that we work collectively to find solutions under the existing system. And, and our agency can certainly commit resources to expedite that review, to um, scope an issue spot, and do everything that we can to help these projects be successful to move forward through the FTC process. That said, you know, I appreciate that the committee may be interested in this proposal. And if you do choose to move forward with um, a time-bound exemption for certain resilience projects, we would strongly recommend that that exemption sunset on January 1st, 2025, um, not 27, which is currently proposed. And we recommend that for a few reasons. First, that provides two full construction seasons under the exemption to um, complete highest priority projects. Um, second, it provides two year window to initiate permitting for projects that would commence beyond 2025. So that seems like a fairly good amount of time for uh, Green Mountain Power and other utilities to uh, initiate and permitting for projects in those out years. Um, third, that timeline uh, seems aligned with the NRB study that if they were to deliver recommendations to um, 
in the 2024 session. Hopefully those recommendations uh, would uh, find their way into law uh, by 2025. And if there was regulatory relief in those uh, recommendations, Green Mountain Power would benefit from them in that, that post-25 construction season. Um, and lastly, you know, if none of that works out and uh, folks are still in the same bind uh, in January 2025, you know, Green Mountain Power and other utilities could certainly come back to this body and ask for that sunset to be extended another year or two if, if that's necessary. Um, so that is, you know, generally our take on this. Um, I would certainly be open to hearing more from uh, the utilities about why uh, the 25 sunset is not acceptable. Um, it does seem from what I've heard so far that given the flexibility in the existing system um, and those two full construction seasons that that should provide uh, pretty meaningful relief to move these projects forward. Um, but certainly if there's more information uh, to consider that, that happens. Sure, thanks for your testimony. I, um, I'm curious if you're aware that if GMP is taking advantage of the, the existing opportunities within Act 250 rules like, uh, to, to do permitting for any of these projects. I know they're in the room. They'll, I'll ask them that question too. I just, they just came to my mind. I, I, as far as um, obtaining a landowner uh, sign off on applications, I don't know. I, that's part of the process we don't typically get involved with. I know that they have certainly engaged us in pre-file scoping for some of their larger generation and, and transmission projects, we've done some of that work on the dis distribution side. So I think, you know, we have a, a reasonably good, you know, we have a good relationship with GMP's technical staff. I think there is open lines of communication. So they have done some of that pre-file work with us in the past. Can you offer any comments on how the areas that, that ANR doesn't have a permit in that you, that I had you restate earlier, how would they be addressed if we kind of give them this reprieve for two years or four years? Um, Their work. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, to be honest. You know, I think we have for riparian area protections, we have guidance that we use in Act 250 that generally, you know, in the first interest instance tries to uh, direct development to maintain a 50 foot or a hundred foot no touch buffer from the top of bank or top of slope of streams and rivers. And, you know, there's some technical analysis in that guidance that um, dictates which, which of those standards is applicable. Um, so that's the starting point for us, but we appreciate that, um, you know, river valley development is often constrained and those default setbacks are not always possible. So we use the Act 250 process to kind of negotiate a reasonable outcome there. Uh, so without that process, I, you know, I don't know exactly how, those issues would be managed. Um, so yeah, we, we don't we don't have we don't participate in the review of those issues outside of Act 250. So without that framework, I don't know exactly how they would be addressed. And a little outside the scope of what we invited you in for, but I think you'll know the answer is how are these areas treated in um, the designation areas? Because you know we're in S100 and a lot of it's hinging on designated areas. So um, <clears throat> Typically, Act 50 jurisdiction is tied to whether a town has adopted uh, zoning and subdivision bylaws. Um, and in towns that have adopted those bylaws, uh, they're called 10 acre towns. And Act 50 is not triggered if there's commercial development on parcels that are less than 10 acres or constitute 10 acres of development, depending on the type of development. And towns, excuse me, in towns that haven't adopted zoning, it's, it's one acre as a threshold. So it, it triggers a lot more in those communities. Towns that have designated, um, state designated growth areas have adopted zoning and subdivision bylaws. So the jurisdictional trigger is that 10 acres, which uh, doesn't sound like it's been much of an issue for the utilities to navigate. Most of their projects are under that trigger. So Act 250 would be applicable. Okay, I guess I was wondering about the wildlife and river corridor reviews separate from the GMP question, um, how they get in those areas, how are they done? Right, so the state designation process does require a certain level of um, bylaws, subdivision and zoning bylaws in those municipalities that are at a, a standard that is higher than kind of what the fall is required in other communities. So there's already some level of 
um, municipal land use regulation is typically more robust than other places. Um, those areas are also areas that are often fairly well developed and um, have less opportunity for significant natural resources than rural parts of the state. So I think that for those reasons, um, there's generally less risk um, for significant natural resource impacts. And they're just areas where the state has identified growth. And I think, um, you know, that is, that is one way to address these issues as is you're saying this is a place where we want to see growth. I know that the neighborhood development area designation does require exclusion or at least there may have been some changes last year, but uh, significant natural resources need to be addressed through the neighborhood <coughs> development area designation. Um, so that is a, probably the, the newest and most robust designation and that does have some fairly clear standards regarding how these issues are addressed. Thanks. Representative Sebelia. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first, I guess, is on Act 250 and the criteria themselves and uh, which of the criteria address, um, I believe Act 250 uh, helps us understand land use, which of the criteria help us um, understand kind of life safety issues related to land use? So for instance, people's um, medical equipment being able to be uh, used reliably or folks being able to call for help reliably, which one of the criteria addresses that? We work primarily in the environmental criteria, so I'm not as familiar with um, the ones outside of that. So to be honest, I, I don't know that I could answer that. I know there's a municipal services criteria, so that it may nest under that one, but the, the NRB would be in the best position to answer that, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, uh, I agree with you. I don't think there is one. Um, and so aside from this issue, which hopefully we will resolve with a waiver till 2027, um, Perhaps this is something we should look at, like we have looked at, uh, for instance, for cell siting and other items which we have deemed critical infrastructure, some sort of expedited process. Um, we talk about um, identified growth areas. Um, of course, uh, rural towns where people have existing homes are not necessarily um, uh, growth areas. They haven't been identified as growth areas. Do you think that those folks uh, should be able to rely on their lights staying on, Mr. Coster? Certainly. I, I live in a rural area. I have a rural a utility provider. My power goes off from time to time. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I think anyone in Vermont should have reliable service. Okay. And are you, do you understand that the situation is getting more extreme? In I, mean, I know that you do with climate change and what we're seeing in terms of the storms and in terms of the outages. We've seen that throughout the state. Year. Would you contest that? Uh, no, I think we've we've collectively known for some time that uh, the results of climate change in Vermont are going to be these more severe weather events, uh, these marginal heavy wet snows, high wind events, high rain events. So I don't think this is you know a surprise to any of us. I think uh, GMP's resilience effort, which they launched a number of years ago, was reflective of that. Um, so absolutely agree, and I, I think. We're committed to working through the NRB process to, you know, look at these sorts of projects in that light and, you know, support durable long-term changes to the Active 50 process to recognize that. Do you, um, do you think that one Vermonter should be able to keep um, the liability, the lights coming on, um, keep that from hundreds of other Vermonters, which is what we're seeing happen here? That's not really for me to say. Okay. Um, so I really appreciate you taking a few moments to speak with me before the meeting this morning. We talked about um, the other issue here, looking at rural infrastructure and, of course, the other urgent crisis we have, which is making sure that rural Vermonters are able to call for help. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about that. We have a lot of money that's invested in that. These are critical uh, partners, the communications union districts working with our electric utilities. This is also tied into that project. And so um, you and I spoke about how uh, going to 25, a waiver to 25 does not necessarily help that additional issue here and that the need to go to 27 uh, could help us with that issue while we 
let's cross our fingers, see comprehensive Act 250 reform next year. Um, you suggested perhaps a list would be helpful in uh, the agency thinking about whether or not a 27 um, a waiver might be appropriate. Is that something that um, we can provide for you um, in the next couple of days, RE critical rural infrastructure projects that we're seeing with our utilities and our CUDs? Would that be helpful in thinking about 2027? Certainly. You know, I think based on the problem statement, as I currently understand it, it seems that the 2025 sunset is appropriate for the reasons I articulated. If there's new information or data beyond that that has been shared with our agency, I'm happy to look at it. And if that um, changes that calculus, you know, um, then it does. So I, I just have not seen a clear articulation for why um, a four-year exemption for these projects is necessary for the reasons I articulated. Thank you. Do other members have questions? Um, I feel like I do, but I can't think of them right now. Thank you for joining us and for your testimony. I can come back if you recall or feel free to contact me directly. Thank you. Thank you. So our next. Witness is Candace Morgan from GMP. Welcome back. Thank you. If it's okay with the committee, I was also going to have my colleague Mike Burke join me at the table as well. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Candace Morgan with Green Mountain Power. Uh, Mike Burke also with Green Mountain Power. Um, and so I just wanted to thank the committee for the opportunity to come back and speak with you all again um, as a follow up to our testimony from last week, I think it was um, about the, the need that we're seeing, especially in some of our more rural territories in our um, service territory, um, in terms of the projects that we need to execute on to provide um, and improve reliability and resiliency in those areas. I don't have any um, slides really uh, for today's testimony, but happy to kind of respond a little bit to some of the testimony that you've since received and also just sort of answer questions was how I was planning to, to address the committee this morning. Um, so I think um, we, I wanna start out by um, expressing appreciation both to the Agency of Natural Resources and the Natural Resources Board for their willingness um, to, to collaborate and continue collaboration on these projects as well as understand and appreciate the, the urgency that we're trying to move within. Um, and so they've come to the table um, to collaborate with us and to continue to work with us, um, which has been true you know, even leading up to these conversations, but especially true more recently. I think in terms of some of the alternatives that have been recommended or pointed out to us um, within the current framework of Act 250, um, for us, it still it comes down to predictability and consistency, and I think a lot of those solutions still leave a little bit up in the air in terms of what the outcome could be. It's you know a little bit district by district, and there's also just some decisions that still have to be made before the projects could begin. And the other thing that comes back to me is also consistency across different towns, right? And you heard um, Billy speak to um, the ten acre versus one acre. And as he mentioned, for us, we very, very infrequently trigger Act 250 review in a 10 acre town, just given the linear length that we're working within um, and sort of how that, that shows up for us. And so Act 250 is not triggered in those, in those towns. Um, it's really in these smaller, um, more rural towns that are one acre towns where we run into this too. And so that's, I think for us, one of the things that we're struggling with is that we're not seeing the, the concerns uh, play out in those 10 acre towns under these types of projects. Um, and so that's the same work that we're planning to do in these one acre towns. Um, so we have the benefit of sort of proving, I think, the, the uh, framework about what we're going to even do in these uh, types of projects, um, as well as how we've shown up in the 10 acre towns already. Um, and so this would really bring consistency across all of our service territory and what we're able to do in um, the same type of timelines there. Um, I'll turn it over to Mike to see if you wanted to add anything, and then I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Yeah, what I would say is when Candace says that we 
build them the same way. We actually have a team at GMP that looks at all the criteria that Mr. Coster spoke to earlier. And we treat those in different towns the same way. Uh, in terms of the predictability and the, the options that uh, were brought forward, we actually have looked at those. And there are some issues with waivers that if you get a waiver and then you still have to change because the homeowner doesn't agree, then you have to go back and do an amended permit, which adds more time. So really it's just none of the options that were on the table allow us to get these projects done in the time frame that we need to get them done. Uh, I was in Townsend again last night, uh, hearing from customers that are desperately, literally begging us to do these projects. And uh, just none of them would be done this year, if uh, even if we filed today. So just the time frame it is not sufficient for us to get these done in the time we need them done. So, Representative Smith. Thank you. Are these customers you're talking about businesses or residential or? Both. Okay. Last think? night was mainly probably one business customer and everyone else was residential. What do you feel the potential might be of these people moving out of state where regulations aren't quite as stringent? I, what I did, I can't answer that. I didn't, one customer did say they had just moved here from California uh, to get away from other climate change issues. And now they're seeing that uh, wet snow is a pretty big issue here. Uh, so, but I, I couldn't answer the question in terms of. Fair enough. Okay. Representative Pat. Um, just trying to get more, I think you may have mentioned this when you were here previously, but in terms of, uh, could you describe, a my understanding of most other types of Act 250 projects is, is that uh, they don't, one project does not cross at, as many town lines as a utility line uh, would. And, and, and uh, could you say a little bit more about the, 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 the Im impact of that, of, of, of having, of, anyway, thanks. Yeah, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, the majority of projects, e even the master plan, it's usually for uh, a ski area or a larger development that's in one place. Uh, and we see that set up more for that. In our case, it's usually going from one town that's a one acre, another town that's a 10 acre, back to a town that's a one acre. And there's different criteria in, in different towns. And in the, in the end, we're gonna build it the same way. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or if you would add anything. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, the, I mean, does that contribute to the uh, the time issue on, in, in terms of the process or? Um, I'm just trying to understand what the, the actual sort of on the ground effect of- Absolutely, sorry, I, I misunderstood yeah. the question. So yes, uh, in the 10 acre towns, uh, if we are under the criteria there, we're able to follow all of our practices, check all our maps, check with our environmental people. If there are any uh, floodplain uh, stream, any issues that were brought up earlier and then build it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the other area, uh, we go through, get all that done ahead of time and then present that other section to Act 250 and then we, wait for that process to happen, which could be anywhere from four to six to nine months uh, after we get all the homeowners to agree uh, to the projects, mm -hmm. which we're doing that in the 10 acre towns too. We always work the, with the landowners on, you know, where they'd like to see the poles, things like that. Mm -hmm. so. But, but you're, you're sometimes going from a 10 acre town to a one acre town to another one acre yeah. town to a 10 acre. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So kind of in follow up to that, I guess, could you speak to, I mean, right now, maybe then the, there are these um, four areas that Act 250 really does fill in gaps in other state permits. And if you're having to meet the standard for the one acre towns um, and you're asking us for this exception, uh, how will you meet that? I mean, I guess I have concerns about the necessary habitat, rare threat and endanger or communities, natural communities, streams and floodways. So. Yeah, I'm happy to sort of have my initial answer and, and Mike can fill that in too. I think, um, so we have to make, 
bring all of those into consideration in our 10 acre towns too, even if we don't trigger Act 250 in, um, in our projects in that space. So we're still working um, on that in, that in that space. The other thing I would say is that we're talking about moving lines that are potentially um, you know, moving through cross country corridors to roadside, right? And so working within um, existing rights of ways along on roadways. And so those are spaces that I think have, you know, their own um, requirements as well. So we'd be moving closer to already, you know, developed and um, built road structures. I don't know if there's any. Yeah, there. oftentimes when we come to that developed roadway, mm -hmm. there's already a telephone line mm -hmm. there. Uh, we're just joining them. So mm -hmm. Uh, but we still are required if there's wetlands, if there's any of those things in a 10 acre town, we're still required to get those permits. Mm -hmm. And we have a process within our mapping system and, and with our environmental people that we look for those in. I guess I'm looking for that gap space. Sure. There is no permit requirement. So if you, if they're all treated kind of as 10 acre towns, and I, I totally appreciate that you're mostly moving into roads and that's great. Yeah. Um, and that will mi minimize uh, impact. So yeah. I'm with you on that. I'm just curious about that gap yeah. space. Absolutely. Or if, there, if you've thought about it and if there's a way to address it. Yeah, I'm happy to to follow up with the committee in terms of what we see as the um, items that are um, met in both in terms of requirement or our best management practices for the different types of, of projects and also within one acre versus 10 acre towns. Because I think um, that's also helpful to sort of see what is covered under all um, of these things, regardless of activity, um, as well being in the mix on that. So I'm happy to follow up with something that provides that kind of breakdown. Thank you. That would be helpful. Sure. Representative Scalia. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm not sure who this question is for, okay. but if you were a municipal utility, can you explain what the difference would be in, uh, would you be sitting here now? Would you need to be asking us for this exemption? Um, I would say we would likely would not be sitting here now asking for this. Um, our understanding of how um, the rules are constructed around municipal utilities is that they effectively um, are treated as 10 acre. They meet, they have to meet the 10 acre um, criteria regardless of any local zoning in the work and service territory that they are providing service to. So they're, um, those projects that they do, I, th I think typically don't meet the threshold to trigger Act 250. And so um, they're, treated in, in that space in that way, right? Yep. Yeah, and, and you know, certainly there are some municipal utilities out there that are just as rural as some of our rural areas. Uh, there's some in Southern Vermont, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Uh, but yeah, they're treated as 10 acre towns, whether they have a development review board or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in addition to GMP, it's my understanding that the other two utilities that um, have different set of criteria than the municipal are the two co-ops. Correct. And we're talking about land mass um, and largest number of rural customers. I believe that is, those are the three. Yep. And so in our municipal places where we want growth, this is easy. Um, in rural rural areas, it's hard. Um, and we'll go back to the question of, sorry, now I'm off on a tangent, life safety in Act 250. So thank you. Representative Tori. I just have a, probably a tangential question as well. So another <coughs> important part of resilience is, of course, the vegetation management that you already do. I'm just curious, as you do the other work that you're talking about doing, Will you also be doing vegetation management at the same time because it's expeditious to do it together? Absolutely. That's a great question. Yes. Whenever we rebuild a line, if there's vegetation there, we trim to make room for the lines, the, uh, which we do the same thing when we rebuild it in place too. So, so yes. Mm -hmm. And that program's a year round program for all of our lines. So. All right. Any further questions for... I'm happy to speak a little bit to the date too, if that's helpful. Oh, um, you know, I, as as proposed to the committee and follow up to our testimony last week, we had a sunset of January one of 2027. The reason for our thinking on that was that it aligns up with our multi-year regulation plan that we currently are under from the PUC, um, and so that really encompasses these types of projects and sort of have been planned out in that in that space. I'm happy to talk about you know what the right landing point is for that, but that is the reason to tie it to that. Um, in addition to 
you know, wanting to provide ample opportunity for larger conversations on Act 250 to play out as they're going to as well. But, and to Billy's point, you know, we wanted to also add in a reference to sort of uh, rebuilding and focusing on critical infrastructure as part of that overall study, just to make sure that both these conversations and all the other things that we have to talk about in Vermont related to infrastructure to support all of our residents um, are, is, a, is a part of that conversation as well. So we would be happy to, to be involved in that process too. Great, thank you. Right. Thank you. All right, next up we have Jim Porter with the Department of Public Service joining us via Zoom. Welcome, Mr. Porter. I can't hear you. So. Uh, we can't hear you. Oh, Mr. He's unmuted. Yeah, um, if you can hear us, maybe you should try rejoining the meeting, Mr. Porter. It's like he left. He can hear us. He's going to come back. Yeah. In the meeting, Joan is unmuted. Can you see him? Oh, we can't even see him. What did we do last time? <laughs> Even more brief, potentially. Oh dear. Um, did he submit his testimony in writing? <clears throat> oh, Representative Stebbins. You're muted. Oh, now you're unmuted. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for seeing my hand. I'm not sure if GMP is still in the room. I I understand um, the rationale for why 2027 was the selected date, um, but I also heard Mr. Coster say that uh, he wasn't certain. Um, you know, he, he it sounded like there could be a preference from their end that it might be 20. 25. And I guess my question is, uh, you know, we just went through the um, 248A uh, sunset discussion about six weeks ago. I wonder what GMP's thoughts are to um, keeping it through 2025. And then in 2025, the legislature would have another check back to assess whether or not it should go through 2027. They are still in the room and they just heard your question and I will ask them back while hopefully Mr. Porter's technical difficulties get corrected. I just Thank you. Yep. Hi. Thank you for rejoining us. Absolutely. Candace Morgan, Green Mountain Power again. Um, I appreciate the, the feedback on that from Representative Sevens and also from the agency. I think, you know, we're open to talking about uh, what the right length of time is and would certainly welcome that conversation within the committee or, or as needed. I just wanted to share that there was a, a um, sort of a rationale on our end for that date that we had put forward, right? So it wasn't um, necessarily just a slightly arbitrary date. It was really tied to our, you know, multi-year regulation plan. <laughs> so I just wanted to provide that context, but of course we're happy to consider whatever um, is most comfortable to, to the committee and to others as well. Great, okay, great, thank you. All right, Mr. Porter, let's try again. Okay, can you hear me on the phone? We can, thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you. I'm Jim Porter. I'm the Director for Public Advocacy um, at the Department of Public Service. 
Um, I would begin by saying that um, Act 250 is much more in A&R's wheelhouse. And so, you know, regarding any Act 250 questions, we would defer to A&R. That said, um, it, as you know, we're very supportive of projects that hasten um, better resiliency with our electric system. As, as you know, um, back around Christmas, we had two storms that resulted in some prolonged outages, largely in rural areas. Um, and as a result of that and the, the number of consumer complaints that we heard about that, we requested, and then the PUC has opened an investigation into best practices and whatnot for the utilities. And so I see this proposal by GMP as another way to get our system more resilient, which becomes more important as, you know, we more and more become reliant on the electric system. Well, one thing that Representative Sibilia mentioned earlier that I would just point out during the storms, we had two issues. One was um, the outage themselves, and two was communications. You know, some of the utilities had better than others in their um, call centers and ability to communicate with customers. Um, you know, the department during that period took kind of an unprecedented step in that we had our staff actually assisting one of the smaller utilities with outreach to its customers who were, I, I think the utility just simply did not have the staffing to, um, to, to, to man the calls. Another thing, I'm a Green Mountain Power customer, and I think when Representative Sibilia mentioned the communication piece of this as well, you know, I access any outage information via an app on my telephone with GMP, which works absolutely great. So long as I have internet or cell service, I live in Montpelier, so it's um, rare, if ever, that I don't. But in the rural areas, we know that's that's not the case. Um, re regarding the, the timing of this, that when this would sunset, all I can say is, and frankly, I'm more familiar with cell towers, um, development plans, and build outs that probably than I am GMPs. However, you know, this year in um, Section 248A, which is the permitting for um, for cell facilities. It sunsets this year, and there was discussion in this committee and others about whether it should be a one-year extension, a three-year extension, or remove the, the sunset altogether. We certainly supported at a minimum a three-year extension just simply because the, um, the build-out plans of these companies um, are – they're done much more in advance than you might think. And so um, sometimes what appears to be a reasonable period when you're talking about building and planning, you know, probably the more time is, is beneficial. And with that, are there any questions I can answer? Do members have questions for Mr. Porter? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Thank you for uh, joining us and and uh, persevering with the technology. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, members. Um, any further comments on this topic, Representative Subilia? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I am having some conversations with um, Mr. Coster, um, the utilities, and others, and hope that we might consider. This timeline a little bit later today. Um, maybe today or, um, or at your within, when you are ready, Madam Chair. When, reality, you're, when we're you're ready, ready. We're, we are considering. Absolutely, we're considering. Thank you. Um, all right, members. With that, I think we'll just take a break till five minutes um, before the hour, and then we're going to reconvene our meeting and um, start in with our Legislative Council on markup on S100. Welcome, Ellen. Good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. So today I am here on draft 1.1 1 
of a committee amendment to S100. Um, so the, you have taken a lot of testimony, and so I haven't been here in a little while to talk about it, but you um, have heard a lot of different um, ideas about some of these sections. So uh, in draft 1.1, there are new languages added, and that is in yellow. Um, so but if you look at it on digitally online, the changes are in yellow from S100 as came over from the Senate. Um, I drafted this as a partial strike all amendment, and maybe as we move forward, we should, I just we touch base about how the committee wants to handle that in relation to the um, a general amendment, making sure that they just line up. Um, I don't know if you want to do a full strike all incorporating all the changes or two strike all. So we can talk about that's a very sort of just traffic control issue. Um, but so it just has the first 25 sections of S100 in it, as opposed to the other sections that House General worked on. Thank you. I think for logistics, that's a really great way to do it okay. for now. Okay. So Yes, so this is just um, sections one through 25, and then there's some additional language. So these were um, amendment requests that the chair requested initially for discussion um, that came from some of the uh, testimony that you heard. Um, and so just moving forward, now that we're in the market process, um, amendment, you've heard a lot of testimony, amendment requests to go in this draft should be part of this conversation. Um, working with the chair and, and I to add things to the draft that should happen like during this process as opposed to just sending an outside email to me. So um, that's what we're going to do today to start today. So on page one, section one, you will recall that section one of the bill is the parking section. So this lang the language um, has been changed. And I believe this is the language that was recommended by EPA. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, it now reads, so a municipality may adopt parking standards for residential uses so on line 14. A municipality shall not require more than one parking space per uh, one bedroom dwelling unit. For dwelling units with more than one bedroom, a municipality shall determine parking requirements based on the context and specific needs of the residential use. This determination shall include factors that allow for less parking, including unique residential uses like senior housing, public transit, on-street parking, public parking, shared parking. For both residential and non-residential uses, a municipality may limit the amount of parking, including by setting parking maximums based on demonstrated need site constraint or vehicle reduction provisions outlined by the municipal bylaw, including transportation demand and transit oriented development. So currently under the statute prior to S100, um, there's already a provision in here that municipality shall not require more than one parking space per bedroom for an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and what came over from S100 in the Senate was not requiring more than one parking space per dwelling unit, um, in, including accessory dwelling units, but any dwelling unit. This is making the change that not more than one parking space, if it's a one bedroom unit, that potentially would include an accessory dwelling unit. And then for larger units, they can set the parking requirement based on context. So this uh, kind of narrows down or, or sorry, opens up the opportunity for municipalities to have more control over parking um, as compared to what we got from the Senate. And I'll, I, I hate it when legislators do this, but I'm gonna do this anyway. Um, like eight years ago, and Burlington has since changed their parking standards, but eight years ago, we wanted to extend a part of our house into our driveway because it was already not permeable um, surface. And we were told we couldn't because uh, there had, be, because then that would mean that the two parking spots that we had to have for our house, um, 
one of them would have meant that the car was in the front of the house. Anyway, my point is, I'm, I, I really liked, I, to me, this reads that if someone builds a two-bedroom unit, then a municipality can say you must have two parking spots. And I, I don't, I, I feel like as an individual, and I know that's not how you develop policy, but I feel as an individual that um, is not in keeping with what we were trying to do with this bill. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. In, in, in just in reference to what you were talking about, so the municipality shall determine those requirements. So does that change what you were talking about? No, I think I think it actually, I think this kind of keeps it still to the status quo in my reading. I mean, except for the, <clears throat> to me, this kind of, the, the bill that we got from the Senate, if I'm reading this correctly, Alan, the bill that we got from the Senate basically said, you really can't tell people you've got to have like five parking lots if you have a five bedroom house, um, parking spaces. And because what it said was, you can't force more than one. That was my sense. One and a half. So yes, what came up from the Senate was one, or if there were parking constraints, one and a half. Um, so this is, yes, I do think this is much more broad than what the Senate proposed. And it is fairly similar to what's already in the statute. It provides more detail than what's already in the statute. Um, towns have, currently under the statute, towns have pretty broad flexibility on how to set parking um, standards for their town. This provides a bit more detail um, on that, but I do think it is closer to the original status quo law than what the Senate sent you. Yeah, I think what's tricky is we've, in having these conversations learned, I mean, we have such a spectrum of towns and every town addresses these differently based on their own on the ground reality. And I've had conversations with folks who live in Montpelier who have the ability to have on-street parking and alternate sides during the winter. In my own town, we have an on-street parking ban because we don't have that opportunity. And that's two kind of developed towns. And then that opens the door for, like it's just such a range of, of needs in communities, I think. Intent is great, encouraging less parking where we don't need it. Um, but the reality is many communities don't have a municipal parking lot it can be used overnight or um, I think somehow we need to make the intent clearer. Less parking could be better and make housing more affordable. And then there's physical realities that they have to work within. Okay. <laughs> Stebbins, then some. What if we, what really, irritated me about the experience that I had is I knew we didn't need that parking spot. And maybe, maybe it's some language here saying that, you know, a property owner can, um, you know, has the authority to ask, work with the municipality to Thank say, you. we don't need this. Please let me do this. Because we were literally told no. And it's not the case anymore, but it's just that, I mean, I knew we didn't need it. And yet, you know, I had no choice until they chose the, they reworked the, you know, this is 2015, reworked the entire rules. Representative Smith. Thank you. <coughs> First, I'd move. Uh, why would you? I second. <laughs> I know that. Uh, when, you want to have one parking or one bedroom apartment is going to be allowed one parking space. What do you do for company or guests? Do uh, they park in the street or find somewhere else to go or tough break? Is that what it is? Or why wouldn't every apartment have at least two parking spaces? Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, I'm having a difficult time understanding how this is an improvement on what was in the original language that we saw we took testimony from towns that yeah had a hard time with it but we had a lot of testimony from the affordable housing folks and like so many people saying they loved this so i'm looking for like right. how we thread the needle because i do hear the concern that you can never require more than one might or one and a half might not work 
Yeah. But I'm also, this doesn't quite get good for me. Just be. Is it fair for a two two bedroom apartment <coughs> to have two parking spaces if one person lives there and chose to have a little bit more room to live? That's my point. Yeah. And so maybe it's the petition. I don't. I don't know. Appeal. I mean, I petitioned and it did nothing. Appeal. Did you say that was the VPA language? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's the Vermont Planners Association language. Um, the other thing I would add um, broadly is that this is dictating what the municipality is allowed to do. Um, and so certain municipalities set parking minimums. I think some of them set parking maximums. Um, if it's a parking minimum, developers may have an option to add more spaces beyond what the municipality requires at the baseline. If a municipality goes to the parking maximum, it's, uh, uh, the developer has the option to add less parking spaces if they think the project doesn't need it. So um, that aspect isn't changing specifically, but this language is about what you want the towns to be able to do in regards to parking. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Representative Bongarts. I'm worried about this. It was one of the pillars of the bill. And this really doesn't do that. If you go to be the page today, <laughs> I have a I have some potential language that we could look at. Um, that is close to the Senate language that says in any district certified municipal sewer and water infrastructure that allows residential uses, municipalities shall not require more than one parking space per dwelling unit. However, a municipality may require 1.5 parking spaces for duplexes and multi-unit dwellings in areas not served by sewer and water, in areas that are located more than one quarter mile away from public parking, rounded down to the nearest total number of the, the total spaces. So it's I guess we just need to talk about the two. We got two visions here. I just have to figure out which way to go. Can, how does 1.5 work at a duplex? If that's the maximum they can require at a duplex, they, 1.5. They can round up to two, because you can round up if you're in a, if you can round up to the nearest number. So a duplex, you, you would have two. Um, and. Let's say two at a duplex. Then why don't they say two? Well, you could say two at a duplex. I don't have a problem with that. that makes sense. Um, but, but overall, like if you have, the, the idea was that if, in the center language, if you have, uh, if the 1.5 works out to 15 and a half spaces, you can round up to 16. But if you're only dealing with two spaces, you can round up from 1.5 to two. That's what you have to work with. Always round up one. This language may not quite say that, but that's it's really the center, basically looking both from the south. That's what we have to just decide which way to go. <laughs> on a testimony. We did have testimony from towns who not happy with this. And we also had a ton of testimony from people who I don't know. Need to pull that out. Representative Sackowitz, then Clifford. I'm curious about we've been hearing a lot about how you know, people have been people have traditionally used some of these parking requirements to make it harder to build housing. Um, and so if the municipality is if that's the goal, then, then that's an effective, apparently, way to, to do that. Um, does, do municipalities have other reasons why they might want to um, have air on the side of more parking rather than less? Like, are there other policy considerations that they're taking into, into account? Um, other. 
I mean, I would say there's the physical limitation of and the cost to the municipality of providing those parking spaces and you know managing snow removal and, and parking on the front lawns. Yes, in places like Burlington, you know that's come up a lot um, when you have multiple units in a building. Um, then that that every <laughs> that building has a car, uh, they need somewhere to park and the. We have that testimony from St. Albans, the affordable housing. Um, often there's multiple people living in those units and they all need a car to get to work and live their lives. There's that. I, I guess I don't have that cynical view that municipalities use it to limit housing development. Maybe some do, um, <laughs> but, and maybe it's had that unintended consequence. But, Working on front lawns is also not great for your neighbors. Or, or perhaps you, Representative Clifton. Thank you, Madam Chair. In, in kind of conjunction with, I think, with the concerns of Representative Sackowitz, is I think this language, it gives, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody could tell me if I'm, if I'm reading this wrong here, but this gives the municipality the right to determine the parking requirements based on the context and specific needs of residential use. So I don't, I think that, I think that's a good thing to let them, to let the municipalities do that. I know in Rutland, there's been projects where, uh, you know, street projects where they, they have that problem where people park you know, on that, that section of right away between the curb and the sidewalk. And what they did was they had these, uh, not every, I understand not every municipality is able to do this, but there's a process underway where those in those areas of the city that the, the city is actually going in and putting the curbing in mm -hmm. and then fixing up those right of ways, which, you know, kind of either would force the, you know, people to, you know, find uh, alternate ways of parking. But I think what they did was they went in and they talked to all the people at the apartments and they they made uh, uh, requirements or, or they made uh, spaces available for those people to park. But I, I, I understand not every municipalities can do that. But I mean, I, I kind of like this where it gives the municipality the control. That's just my opinion. Representative Sackowitz. <coughs> so this section is about zoning and the language, the new language is saying that the municipality shall have, shall take into a bunch of, take into account a bunch of different factors when they decide about what the parking rules. But some, it just strikes me that you could easily have, you know, different sorts of development within the same zone that could have very different needs. So, but this doesn't seem to be on a case by case basis. It's really about setting the language in zoning um, as, a, as, a, as a whole. So I guess I'm, I don't understand. It just feels like kind of a disconnect between what the language is and the, and the context within which um, it would be used. So I would just say that um, currently towns are using a variety of methods to require parking for different uses. Um, I don't think towns are doing blanket parking zoning. Um, towns have different strategies. So some towns have parking minimums or maximums based on the type of use that is in place. And so residential use versus commercial use. And then within that, what type? Additionally, um, there was testimony in the Senate, I don't know if you had it here, that some towns do um, a required for residential uses, um, one parking space per bedroom is a fairly common one, or two per bedroom. So some of them do it by bedroom, um, and that's a fairly common me method, not necessarily by the size, the, the physical square footage of the building, but by the number of bedrooms um, within a unit. So. I do think towns are already using a variety of methods. Um, this is a little bit of a change here because it is specifying about one bedroom units. Um, 
And then for other bedroom units, it's allowing them to determine. So um, I do think towns are already making different decisions based on the type of usage, whether it be commercial, industrial, or residential. Do you think they already take that into account? Would, would they also be taking into account, like, you know, whether it's senior housing or other other uses, which by their very, very nature might require different amounts of land? So I haven't heard specifically about if towns are making different changes about senior housing. Um, I think there are, I do think I have heard developers propose, le propose less parking in senior housing, but I don't know if zoning has specifically mentioned that. I, so I, I, so I don't know, I don't know. Other thoughts? In my bit. All right. Let's <laughs> sit with that one and move we'll back up and uh, the manager. Yes. We can back up and state what we're trying to accomplish here. It's what is the problem? <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the parking requirement mm -hmm. specifically. So the, the current statute says one per bedroom. Towns have that. So currently, the towns have very broad authority on setting parking minimums or maximums. The only um, limit that's currently in there really is about for accessory dwelling units. Um, they can't have, they can't require more than one parking space per bedroom, but only for accessory dwelling units. So that is, a that's, but otherwise, they have pretty broad discretion when setting the amount of parking spaces um, they want um, per use. And so the Senate version introduced a limit, and now you're looking at sort of modifying that. I don't know what your specific goal is, but that's just recap. I think I concur with that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So a three bedroom can have three parking places? So that's not what this language says. That's what I thought. Um, what this language says is that for um, residential uses with more than one bedroom, the town can set the amount of parking spaces. Okay. Um, in the Senate's version, um, it was one parking space regardless of bedrooms, unless um, there were parking constraints, and then it could be 1.5 parking spaces. Put a half a car somewhere like that. Yes, half great idea. Yes. So, great thinking. <clears throat> Representative Stackowitz. So if we if we don't if we don't think that zoning around parking is 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 intentionally um, being manipulated to reduce this kind of development seems then like what we're really saying that is we want to change the rules because we don't think municipalities are just are doing a good job of figuring this out and we're going to figure it out for them it just seems like maybe we should just be um, helping them do a better job of figuring out what, what, their, what their needs are on these case by case basis well, i guess i thank you i wanted to say Representative Morris, to your point, I mean, I think the problem we're trying to solve is mandating unnecessary parking. And the question is, do we agree that there's unnecessary parking that's been mandated? And if so, what is this, like our role in encouraging communities to have um, zoning that addresses that concern? Um, ironically, we heard from a, the developer of, a, of the property in Middlebury, the Summit Properties, um, Zeke, you know, he said he's trying to do his best with uh, what you would call smart growth and, and compact development. And he's still providing, I think, two units, two parking spaces per two bedroom units. So I am um, not sure what the what our role as state legislators writing statute for the whole state is in this conversation. Um, I would go to Representative Clifford <coughs> next and then Representative Stubb. Which, which yeah. and I guess I'll ask the question, is it necessary for us to 
talk about zoning in this bill at all, rather than just let the municipalities and the planning commissions deal with what they have to deal with? Do we have to regulate? I mean, we, I know we regulate things, but I mean, as far as this goes, and as far as, you know, trying to find a, a, a quicker solution, obviously, to the housing problem, wouldn't it be better if we let the municipalities deal with it themselves with their local planning commissions rather than us deal with this? That's, that's the question I have. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. Representative, Representative Todd. Yeah, I've been struggling with this because on the one hand, I think part of the reason why uh, uh, the, the, there's a thought to sort of put some limitations on the amount of parking space is how much room are you taking up in a, in a developed downtown area for parking versus housing? Um, uh, on the other hand, this is very arbitrary and you're trying to guess when, when, it, when someone is saying, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for uh, uh, permits to do a building with four units, you're trying to guess ahead of time who's going to be living in, in those units and how many people and what their, their needs are, where they work, whether they're going to need a car or not to, to go to, I mean, it just like, it, it, it's, it seems, uh, it seems arbitrary to try to put this, uh, too many parameters into right. into statute itself here. Um, I, I understand. I understand the uh, what's 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 behind the intent, but it, it doesn't. Uh, I, I, for for every situation that I can think of, I can think of a yes, but what if the family or the people moving in have this you know situation or that's it? Some people may require more vehicles than 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 other people in the same. Uh, in the same unit, so I, I'm not. I'm, I'm struggling with it. I don't know how to resolve that. Representative Stevenson Smith. So since I'm the one who um, threw out the first um, little mini implosion on this first uh, proposed language discussion, I would be okay with this language as long as there was. I mean, we have a 10 persons rule somewhere else. Is there an opportunity to say, um, you know, an owner of a property or a, develop of a developer of a property, um, you know, can overrule, or I don't know what the word is, the municipality requirements if a, if a clear case is made. I mean, even just on my street, again, it was 2014, little house on a corner, grandparents built their own ADU and they had to hire a lawyer and spend like 10k to get through Burlington to get an approval and they had to like put in their deed I think even that they would never buy a car because they have car share right down the road so I, I guess I just like to make it a little bit easier or at least to have one opportunity that if it turns out a municipality has some um some proposal that works 90% of the time. Is there a method forward that isn't quite so onerous? Representative Smith. Thank you. In Derby, we have a town plan that gets re redone every five years. We have a DRB and we also have a zoning board. So, and we've got a pretty good zoning administrator most of the time. And uh, I don't know why this needs to be mandated. If you've got coverage like that, each town knows their own town and what the capabilities are and what they can and can't do. Senator Bonger. So I want to go back to what's you know what's the intent here, and we're talking about areas with sewer and water, where the idea is compact, walkable. Parking takes up room and adds a lot of expense. And this is about shifting the paradigm. Um, and it's not, I'm, I have no doubt it won't be without some, uh, some difficulty getting there. But number one, if it's a kind of development that if it wasn't one car per space, or one space per unit, 
the developer is free to build more if that, this is just saying what the municipality can and can't mandate. And if we just leave the status quo and we're trying to, we need, to extent, we need a lot of, we need to develop housing. We want it to be in these compact areas. If we have the housing competing with parking, it's really um, a challenge. And maybe the municipalities are, you know, are gonna have to get creative and figure out ways to talk for more, um, or parking uh, in municipal lots, and that'll be that'll be something they're probably looking at. But I just have a real concern that that you know, there was so much testimony from people trying to build <coughs> that this is a key pillar of what it's going to take to get there. I don't want to see it. You know, just the, it's, you know, it's going to be a transition, and it's, it, transitions aren't always, I don't know if it's pretty or not, but, well, um, but I, I just really worry that we're... The, the language that came over from the Senate, I don't think is limited to water and sewer. I mean, your area, yours might be, yeah. but this is... So, Rep. Mm -hmm. would you be suggesting that this is a stumbling block the way it is in building? Yeah. Agreed. Huh? Did you... Um, well, I... I... I don't know if you received testimony, but I did on this specifically, but I think there was testimony in the Senate specifically about larger developments and so multi-unit dwellings specifically where this has been an issue. And so hypothetically, if a town requires four parking spaces or five per dwelling unit and someone is trying to put in um, 50 units of housing, 250 parking spaces are going to need to be constructed on that same site. 50 times five, did I get that right? So, I mean, that's that's an example. I don't know if that's an exact number. Five car parking spaces per year. Right, so like in a, if a two, a two bedroom dwelling unit requires at least two parking spaces per bedroom. It's 50. So I'm just saying, I think there were different numbers that were, that was for, Okay, so I'll stop. I was just trying to be helpful that I think that there was testimony in the Senate about larger developments, specifically having size issues on parcels because of the parking minimums in some towns. And I don't have a number specifically off the top of my head, so I should probably stop. And actually, Chip Sawyer provided one that was about units. Yeah. Oh, okay. His suggested language um, manner in St. Albans was he had a threshold of 20 dwelling units. So. Couldn't, couldn't require more than two spaces for um, up to 20. And then after that, couldn't require more. Gets to the scale of that you're talking about. Senator Logan. Thanks. I just keep going back to this original language that we had um, that actually had some sort of standard for when you might want to exceed Um, one parking space per dwelling unit. It was in the case of, um, you know, basically access to parking out off, off the property being more than a quarter of a mile away. How many of you walk a quarter of a mile away from to get to your house to park your car? That, that to me is... That's far. Doesn't quite, like with your groceries or whatever. I can't oh, but I mean, you would still have at least one space per unit mm. on site. It would be the idea being that uh, like people have a hard time parking properly. Like, just trying yeah. to park itself. Yeah. Yeah, just... <laughs> no, that's long, but I, I appreciate the attempt here to establish, you know, sort of like the maximum distance one should have to walk to get to their second vehicle in, for their home. Yeah. All feet. Uh, I think. All right. I think we should. Representative Tory. Just, I, I'm not as comfortable with the one bedroom insertion. I think, I think household really was more of the intent. Sure. And I think yeah. that's important as our, we've learned how small our household sizes are getting. And that we're talking about smaller. Smaller 
of whole unit, um, smaller and denser construction. Um, so we're trying to encourage that. Right. So I you're mean, saying that's the whole goal of the bill. Yeah. Not more than one parking space per dwelling unit. Right. Yeah. I mean, we could say, yeah, I just think putting in one bedroom means that my children. Yeah. And then they will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Representative Sackowitz. I want to reiterate um, the, the, the comment about scale and how that, how that makes a big difference, I think, because, um, you know, if, if you have, you know, just one or two units in a building, of each small one or two bedrooms, you can easily imagine a, a range of scenarios where you need very little parking, or you need three or four times that amount of parking, depending upon who's living there. And it could change a lot depending on the year to year. If you have a big building with 20 or 30 or 50 units, all that variation is gonna get spread out and averaged out over, over time. So you're never gonna have a time where you suddenly, that building needs three or four times as much parking as it did the year before, you know, the, the variation is going to be much, much, much narrower. Um, and so I could see, um, including, you know, um, minimums based upon that, that, that size, that, like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that's a, a maybe getting to the challenge here, <clears throat> that the affordable housing folks are talking about those larger developments and the um, creation of a, a sea of parking that's not not needed. I know, but I, Page two. Parking is always one of the tricky issues. I don't know why I started this bill with that, but <laughs> anyways. The spider's okay over there. Flowers. No, it's over here. <laughs> you have to leave it on. I want to go down that valley there. He was happy on the flower. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on page three, on page three is the next topic. Okay. So, um, I do want to, so on page three, the first paragraph on page three um, is not highlighted. Um, but this is where the duplexing by right and uh, quadplexing by right in water sewer service areas language is located. Um, I do want to flag an issue that came up. Um, there isn't a change here, but I I do think there was um, a lot of there was at least multiple pieces of testimony regarding the word allowed use versus permitted use. So I just wanted to touch on that. Um, in the early version of S100, it was originally permitted use, which I do think is more classically known as the by right provision, which would be um, by right a duplex. Allowed use, I think, um, allows a, it is a weaker provision uh, in that it allows the town to potentially con do conditional use review, which would require a permit. Um, so uh, if you were to change this to permitted, that potentially wouldn't allow for a conditional use review. As it reads as an allowed use, uh, I do think that allows for conditional use review by the town. So I don't know if you wanted to discuss that today, but I think you heard from multiple witnesses about whether or not to change that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I mean, I guess while we're talking about this one, I I understand the intent of this is to help make uh, housing more affordable, but I also think that the goal of this bill is uh, supposed to be about smart growth. And I wonder if these sort of duplex by right isn't encouraging people to spread out and not be in smart growth areas. I, I look at the duplexes as going to be a single family house that's already happening. So I don't, and Plex has one foundation, one driveway, one set of services, and it really results in the ability of two people to live, or two families, whatever it is, to live where there would have been one. Um, 
And I, I guess I think that if we're, if we're going to, wherever you're going to allow to build a single family home, why wouldn't we say you can build a duplex? Right? Because it's the land use pattern outside of traffic. And I, I will confess that, but in terms of disturbance to places we'd rather not have it, it doesn't change anything. It's only happening where we want. And it's a way to get more housing without actually making anything more than happened with, with one. Representative Sackowitz. Yeah, thank you. I, I'd say that we would be opening up the possibility of development that would happen that might not have happened because of the economies of scale and that you do get from a, from a duplex for bringing the costs down, which is, what we, which is what we're trying to do in most places, but it would also have the same effect in more rural areas where Somebody might say, well, if I, if I only can build a single family home, that's too expensive. But if I can put a duplex there, now I can bring my costs down to the point where now I have a very nice, you know, rent, you know, place that I can rent at, at market rates that where I couldn't have before. And so we would actually be supporting developing places where maybe we don't want. <clears throat> I'm hearing that, thinking about that, and thinking about um, rural towns where I live. And um, you know, I think that the I think what I'm hearing you say is that makes it easier to build or less expensive to build. And so then, you know, I'm thinking about okay, so uh, only from away should be able to live in our small towns. That's, you know, is that what we're saying? Not in our small towns, not in, in the... So if we're built... In, 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 the, in the places, you know, what, um, in the places where we are saying that this conversation has been around, that, you know, that we want development, we want, you know, people to be building in the villages, in the, in the already developed areas. And we want to discourage development outside those areas. And I think that if we allow duplexes outside those areas, we're just encouraging development. And yes, it makes it, it would make it, I mean, I just thought of this when, when Rick Bunger brought this up. So I, I guess I haven't thought it through all the way, but my, my, my biggest concern would be um, people would be helping up with more rental units in, in these outlying areas. I'm not sure that that's, that's really something we want to see. Representative Stebbins. Um, thanks, Ron, Chair. I, I hear your concern, Representative Sakowitz, with the way it's written. I, I really liked the concept of I write, you know, duplex or you know, if you have a if you have a building, just as the fellow from Manchester, Bennington, Bennington, um, uh, just as that individual was saying, if you have a unit and you can split it into four, that we should not be making that more challenging. Um, I guess what you're saying reminds me of one of the comments that Thomas Weiss said, which was, "Are we being clear enough about?" yes, we want this easier development to occur, not, you know, um, in the middle of nowhere. And I guess I, I just thought I hear your concern. And if there was a, a way to articulate this more clearly that it's not, oh, okay, so if you have a one large home <laughs> at the top of a, I don't know where, it's really remotely far away. That's not necessarily what we're hoping to have you make into you know, a four unit house. I don't know if there's a way to do that with the language because I don't, I don't think that's our intent. I wonder if that gets to the allowed versus permitted and the town can decide how they want to use this. Through conditional use, through conditions. I, I would also ask us to think about the fact that we have a lot of housing stock 
this isn't really going to, in my view, not likely, but may result in some new duplexes, but it will, I think it's also very likely already with people living now, as we heard a lot of testimony about, in houses that are way too big for them. Um, and that the average size is now different. And so why would we leave that housing stock essentially sitting there um, when we're trying to um, encourage, uh, <coughs> we're trying to develop a system for housing that actually fits the needs of the lot now, which is very different than what it was in the 1950s. And a lot of this housing was built. And I, I don't, I, I think, the duplex by right, especially when you think about a lot of the rural areas, that's where the house, that's where if you're going to get housing, that's where that's one of the places it's going to come from. And um, if we don't um, make that uh, permitted, I, and I think the word permitted is key to this actually, the most important versus allowed, um, then we're, you know, we're just again not going to see as much housing as we could be seeing um, when we have um, such a deal. One thing that Zach mentioned was um, existing housing. I mean, he's, his business is really grounded in a lot of what we're hoping to encourage, right. which is the reuse of existing housing that's overbuilt. And so, and that, that's kind of what you just framed your start with. And so is there a way to do it through, you know, encouraging the existing housing stock to be utilized better in this bill, which I think is a big, I'm seeing a lot of nods. So yeah. Representative Sackowitz. Well, don't we already have parts that in this bill concerning ADUs? So if somebody is, is, does have a rural property that they, that is too big, that they can convert that to an ADU, which is different than a duplex. So it's on the same page. So it's already, so we would have that capability. Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, this this does say that um, in any district that allows year-round residential development already. Um, and unless we're mandating a particular kind of housing plan in every municipality, um, it does seem like we need to allow um, municipalities to establish their own residential districts. Um, but then, so I'm, I'm putting it in the context of where I currently live in Burlington, um, there are districts within the city of Burlington where uh, single family housing is the kind of development that's allowed. Um, and so I think the, the right to build a duplex or develop a property into a duplex in a area previously zoned only for single, single family housing is great. <laughs> Actually, that's a huge improvement um, because that really does bias higher income households, um, decreases density in you know, very residential neighborhoods within Burlington um, and in effect creates you know, higher income neighborhoods versus lower and middle income neighborhoods. So it seems like an improvement. I think my overall concern about the, the loosening up of um, development restrictions in the state is that it isn't necessary. These over the course of the bill um, aren't tied as they are in a place like the city of Burlington to certain requirements around a percentage of that housing being developed for the purposes of permanently affordable housing. Um, and the the timeline for um, like a the funding for the moderate income housing only needing to be moderate, affordable for moderate income households for a couple of years after the development takes place rather than permanently affordable. For VHIP, for example. Yeah, for VHIP. Um, so I, I think 
higher density and already single family household neighborhoods is, is a good idea. Um, duplexes, fine. I would be okay with even more. Well, within, if you read, I mean, this is areas served with municipal water and right. sewer. It's fourplex. Yeah, yeah. So it is. Yeah, more. so that's good. So, yeah. I think, though, that again, going back to the range of towns that we are working with, yeah. Almost, I, mean, I would, we A, don't have a zoning kind of review for right. context of this bill. Um, and, um, you know, B, the default allowable use is usually a house. Right. Um, no matter the minimum acres of, of parcel size or whatever else happens. So it's a challenge, I think. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's why. Yeah, without an overall smart growth plan. Yeah, we don't have. <laughs> yeah, we don't have there. Yeah. Are there other comments on this, Representative Sacco. Thank you. I, I guess I would. I would just say we could have um, duplexes where where single family homes are allowed um, in designated areas and areas where there's like existing water and sewer. You know, in in those places where we're we want to see development. Yeah. Well, I guess my concern there is if if development is already going to be happening in a place because we're not doing anything to prevent it in this bill. And, and as far as I can tell, right, we're not preventing any further development. So if there is going to be further development, it could be a duplex rather than a family home. That would be an improvement. Um, unless... We're seeing duplexes pop up in places where single family homes wouldn't wouldn't have been built. Yeah. Represents mm -hmm. I'd like, are we preventing development by mandating one parking space per single single bedroom unit? Did you say are we preventing it? Yeah. Um, I think that some people think we are. Yeah, I, I think we are. You think yeah. That was all. So I just want to back to this duplex thing. A lot of our towns don't have sewer and water. They're desperate for housing too. And the duplex is kind of by definition water income housing. Um, and that's one of our key missing pieces. And I you know, really like the focus of this building kind of really maximize asking what we could do with areas with sewer and water because that just makes sense to me. Um, but we also have a lot of towns who are desperate for housing that don't have access to that at this point. <clears throat> and the real need is lower and moderate income housing than duplex is almost by definition. Uh, it's that bill. So I am very much in favor of allowing it anywhere we are. <laughs> Where if you have single family, I'm in favor of it being able to be a duplex. Yeah, I that is. others who haven't spoken on this. I, I just have a, a clarification on we're in this, this paragraph where it talks about uh, multi unit dwellings with four or fewer units shall be an allowed use. Does, does the interpretation of the word allowed just means that it can't be prevented? Or if we change it to permitted, then it would have to go through the permitting process of the local? No. It's actually the opposite. It's actually the opposite. Yes, permitted might not need a permit. It's a, it's a by right. And allowed means they're allowed to do conditional use review. So they might not do conditional use review, but they also could do conditional use review, which is a permit. Thank you. I know, I feel like I should <clears throat> write it down. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, I honestly was not here for most of your testimony, so I don't know if anybody else said it's um, going to come down to like the the town planners would prefer allowed, and the um, others that were working with Seth prefer permitted. So similar to the parking conversation. I 
and allowed gives the town can have a conditional more. use permit if right. they would like. They don't have to, but they could. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next challenge. I mean, <laughs> section. Well, I think the next one is a little bit simpler because it's a very minor change on the bottom of page three. Oh, we're rolling right along. Yeah. Um, so at the bottom of page three, subsection E is where the accessory dwelling unit regulation has, has been for a long time. So there are a couple of I think minor changes to that statute. So the may becomes a shall, so that shall have the same review as a single family dwelling. Um, that hasn't changed. There's also that criteria for conversion shall not be more restrictive than for a single family. Um, but the change is at the bottom of the page. And so um, it's striking the language about accessory dwelling unit definition and moving it exactly identically to the definition section. Um, and so uh, that was something I asked for. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like we had a definition section and it referred back to the accessory, and it would be easier for the reader to have it in the definitions. Yeah. And so the language isn't changing, it's just being moved to section four. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to, but do any, does anyone have questions on the, um, on this section? I don't want to just go through the things that, you know, if you do have questions, please ask them. Great. Great. Section, uh, page four. Um, so on page four, subsection H has language about hotels. So a, a bylaw can't prohibit or penalize a hotel from renting rooms for those using um, housing assistance with public funds. And this has not been changed. And I actually don't know if we received any testimony on this section specifically. I'm not sure, but we did talk about what is a penalizing mean in this instance and where why is that word in there what would, how would a town uh, yes. penalize a hotel um i'm not sure mm -hmm. so representative smith uh, representative clifford may have some ideas about section h here because i i've understood that there are concerns in rutland in that area about uh state funding hotel rooms for homeless people and it's it had i i think and i could be wrong it, ha, it had created you know problems for tourists that wanted to come into the area to visit uh is that anything we should be concerned with got a question for representative clifford i guess it could be um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. I don't see how you would. It has been a concern. I mean, it just that's you know, it's been a concern um, in other municipals as well. But I'm not sure if you could penalize hotel for renting rooms. I don't think if it's if it's even legal. I don't, I, I don't think I think it'd be up to whoever could be wrong. I, I think it's who if, if the person wants to rent that room for for those purposes. I I don't see where it's <clears throat> I don't see what law is going to say you can't. Is there? So, I mean. Uh, I mean, that's nothing you can do about it. Well, unfortunately, no. Um, that I think that whole scenario was, you know, brought on by COVID and by other reasons, and it's, it happens, it happens. And now you got to kind of work on, you know, what you do. What you do going forward and that's i think a lot of the different municipalities have a plan but uh, i just don't i don't see where any law would prevent that from can't tell a business owner what unless it's against the law mm -hmm. that's the way i'm looking at 
Representative Pat. Yeah, I, I don't think you can, uh, in, in the case of hotel, um, uh, basically discriminate about where, where, how is the person paying for the room? So, so if the person's using public funds versus out of their own pocket, that you, I don't think we can put that into law. The, you know, the discussion that we 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 have had in the legislature is more a bit, uh, more in terms of are we going to continue funding a certain program and and and, and all of that. We certainly had debate about that, but that. That's the appropriate place to uh, debate uh, what the impact is when, when uh, you know, uh, a lot of hotel rooms are filled with, with, uh, with people who, who don't have anywhere else, else to go. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can, uh, it would be discriminatory if you said, well, I can't rent, to, I can't rent a room to you uh, because, or I won't rent a room to you because, uh, uh, Thanks. It's being paid for with public funds versus uh, uh, your own person. Yeah. Okay. It seems like this is we're okay with this language. Yeah. All on, right. Moving on. So, still on page four, subsection twelve. So, this is about um, density. Um, so, subsection twelve. Uh, there was a. Uh, a suggestion, I think, from South Burlington to change district to area because municipal sewer and water infrastructure spans districts and may not be a regular shape as a district. It may just be an area. So that change has been made and I'm happy to discuss further. So it now reads, in any area served by municipal water and uh, sewer and water infrastructure that allows residential development, Bylaws shall establish lot and building dimensional standards that allow four or more dwelling units per acre um, for each allowed residential use. And density standards for multi-unit dwellings shall not be more restrictive than those required for single family dwellings. Um, and so the, as it came over from the Senate, it was five units per acre, and this is going back to four. And that was a recommendation because the NDAs are at four. And I don't know. It was just sort of to make them line up and be consistent. And maybe when we talk about NDAs, we could revisit it as to why it's for there. Yeah. So you want to wait to talk about it? Well, if you have something to say about it now, I'm yeah. fine with that. If, but I, if that was why it, yeah. that's why it was just so that we weren't creating inconsistencies. My own view is that. Five is like the, we be at least at five here. Um, there's 43,560 square feet in an acre. Uh, if you have you know, buildings with a thousand, with a footprint of a thousand feet, that's a lot. One, that's a big house, but that's only 5,000 feet out of 43,000. I realize there's parking and other things, but in areas that are served by sewer and water to go, the whole point here is to get some density there. And um, so I, I am, in my mind, we have you know, just the end case we have to rather than, rather than this way and, and keep it so keep it so, high. so that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And five is really not very dense. Right. I'm fine with that. I just want to make yeah. sure we discuss it when we get to the end yeah. so, Others have thoughts or questions on this? Representative Clifford. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm thinking this is what the, uh, one of the concerns that Mayor Dunn just had from Rutland as far as uh, to allow these happen it's going to it's it's going to depend on again what i think what his testimony was about if the lines or service lines can even take it um and i think every municipality that has water and sewer is going to have a concern about that so i just you know if we come back to it's fine well i think we're going to get to that in the water and sewer service area okay. definitions okay and i think that south burlington also brought up concerns about like a natural resource issue 
and that that's going to also come back to us when we talk about those definitions Great. of a water and sewer service area. Thank you. Yep. So, am I making a change in the next draft? Um, maybe we're going to put yeah. I think yes, ending the conversation about NDAs, change it to five okay. and water and sewer service areas. Okay. So still on page four, subsection 13 is the density bonus section. And so as it came over from the Senate, and I'll, I'll read you the, the new language as it is here, but as it came over from the Senate, um, affordable housing, um, an affordable housing development could add an additional floor and uh, add an additional 40% above the maximum density. Um, and this is removing the floor. So as it would, as it reads in this draft is in any area served by municipal water and sewer infrastructure, sewer and water infrastructure that allows residential development, any affordable housing development as defined in 4302, including mixed use development, may exceed density limitations for residential developments by an additional 40% provided the structure complies with the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code. So it's getting rid of the uh, may add an additional four beyond <clears throat> the maximum set by the town. That seemed to have unintended consequences for towns that already have multiple floors allowed and um, possibly with fire protection. But we represent separate. I'm, I've been thinking about this part for a bit, and I'm, it just seems like if we have rules around density, I'm, I'm not and, there, and the rules are in place for good reason, then I'm not sure why it matters whether it's affordable housing or not. Like, it just seems, just, I don't see the, the, what the, what the, it just doesn't seem like a natural fit. So I would say that some towns already do this, where they provide a density bonus for affordable housing. So affordable housing is allowed to be more dense than the other housing. So I'm, that is a, definitely a policy consideration, but I think this is modeled on what some towns are already doing. I guess I would say I don't, it still doesn't mean that it makes sense to me yeah. doing it. Senator Bongar. Well, it's the way to encourage more. No, I understand what it's trying what it's trying to do. It just seems like if you have good reasons for keeping density at a certain level, why should it matter whether the housing happens to be affordable housing? What's what does the cost of the housing have to do with what's the appropriate density? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Putting that aside for a second, the whole the concept here is that you uh, use up the, the concept for going up. That's the main concept here. It's that. You're not increasing your footprint. You're in an area with sewer and water that meets fire code, um, and you can sprinkle the building. And so, it's it's a way to. The idea was to encourage more affordable housing by giving the bonus, um, and um, and you know, what we're really realistically what we're talking about in many cases would be going from two to three stories, depending on your district, or three to four, um, and. If we want to, um, frankly, I just heard Gus say this, you see, like, say this from beach to be a number of times, so I don't want, but you know, you, you've got, you got to go up if you want to go housing. Sure. Um, sure. And so this is, I think, in my my towns can still have design control, they can still have site plan, design um, review and site plan, but it just makes intuitive sense to me that we make it possible in all communities to go up. And part of the concept of this whole, at least age 68, was a lot of communities are moving in this direction. Some communities are moving in this direction already. And it's just like move it along and get it get it done. And so um, I kind of, I like the, I'm very, I, I particularly like the, 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 the ability to go up to, let's say, four floors for housing. You can see, yeah, go ahead. So, and I, I, I agree that that makes sense. So if that amount of density actually does make sense for a given area, why not require that we allow greater heights for all buildings, not just affordable housing buildings? Like, yeah. we'd make it even better. Like, we can, have, we can have market rate housing that is 
also taller. Like I still doesn't, I don't see why we would pick one or the other just on the basis of cost. Hold on, I have um, Cecilia, Logan, and then Corey. Yeah, I'm interested in this conversation and I think I have the same question that Representative Sackowitz is asking. That seems to make sense to me, but I wonder if we were to, I also share the need to go up, but if we, if we are not limiting it to just affordable <clears throat> housing, does that create any burdens? I mean, I, I think I'm interested in the discussion, hearing more. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So. The representative uh, Logan. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm not sure why the building height limitations part was taken out here. I must have missed the testimony. Um, yeah, so I, um, towns have said we already, like if we're allowing four already, um, then you're gonna tell us we have to have five. We're gonna go to three to meet your need. So it has unintended consequences when you try to, like, cause some towns are already doing it. All oh, right. And they may not wanna be told they need to add one more when they've already gone to, they've had this discussion and they've chosen three, four, five, whatever, 14 in Burlington, I don't know. Um, so it, this is, again, gets to, we have such a variety of our, in our community. So representative. Or, so or, just to uh, follow up though, so may exceed density limitations. So that would have the same effect. Basically. It, you could go up. Absolutely. That's the, I mean, I think for, we want to encourage people to go up. Right. And so I think to the extent that we think of um, yep. carrots, not but we can't mandate it. Or, yeah, right. I think. So but we're not choosing to mandate it. That's what we're talking about. Right. But so um, anyhow, just in defense of, of, uh, of framing this out in terms of affordable housing development, I think the idea would be because we're not <clears throat> mandating any percentage of housing development be affordable, despite the fact that we know that that's the greatest need for housing in our state. Um, this incentivizes the development of affordable housing because it allows you to build more on a particular piece of property. You're allowed to build yes. up or, you know, a denser uh, development if it's an affordable housing development, but not if it's market rate. Yeah, my question was about the mixed use development that's called out. Um, so that would be a fall on the first floor going up, because I know that's usually like an important thing to be able to encourage. Was that a question? Yeah, I guess I'm okay. talking about whether the mixed use development um, covers enough of what you're getting at um, about housing types. So, is that in our definitions or? I think so. So, affordable housing is defined in, uh, in, title, in chapter 117. And so currently affordable housing in this chapter means um, at least 20% or a minimum of five units, whichever is greater, are affordable housing and subject to um, affordability covenants for, 50, for at least 15 years. Um, and affordable means does not exceed 30% of gross annual income of a household with 125% of the following and it's county median income um, MSA, median income, or statewide median income. So it's 120% of area median income. And so um, mixed use uh, does include use of commercial space. It doesn't necessarily have to be the first floor. Um, and I'm looking, and so I don't think there's a definition of mixed use in chapter 117 specifically. In Act 250, um, 
the definition of mixed use requires that um, the housing be at least 40% of the development. So 60%, it can be up to 60% commercial and 60% housing. Um, I, I'm looking right now and I don't see it here in, um, in chapter 117. So I don't think there's necessarily a mandated size of the split, but it would be the inclusion of a commercial space. On the, I'm looking currently for the definition of mixed use, I, and I'm not finding it, but do you know if it includes the word hotel? So you could actually have, you know, cafe, hotel, shop, plus housing. So I just said I also didn't find the definition of mixed use in Sorry. chapter 117. Because I was looking. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Um, so hotel we can find that for later yeah uh i'll keep looking yes um I, and the re so i think under act 250 hotels actually fall under lodging and then so i'm not sure if it is commercial <coughs> if there's a distinction between commercial and lodging uh, because there isn't a definition um towns would have the ability to specify that um or you could specify that if you'd like. I'll follow up later. I just want to, I guess one question is about we have mixed use across town one place, but it's still there in another. So what does that mean? But then I have a bigger so that's that question. Then I have a, I'll just say that I don't believe in any, in the way this is structured, for affordable housing right now. I don't believe any towns would change their height limitations. Um, they go from three to two in order to not have a building somewhere that might happen to, with some affordable housing in it. I, I just don't think that will happen. Um, and what this does is for affordable housing, it can more possible to get some built. And that's really what it, what it does. But what I do have that question about what is the impact of taking it out in that one place and having it still be in the other, or is it just redundant or? So this was the proposed language from EPA or possibly VAPTA. Um, and I don't know, because I didn't actually hear their testimony. I think it is an acknowledging an acknowledgement of the fact that mixed use isn't actually defined. And so it's moving it so that it's not being part of that clause, referencing a definition because it now reads affordable housing development, including mixed use development. So it's suggesting that, I think it's suggesting that it's affordable housing development. Um, it could be an affordable mixed use development. So, okay, so this is coming down to definitions. And what I was actually just saying a minute ago is that mixed use development is not defined in chapter 117. Mixed use development is defined under Act 250. Under the Act 250 definition, mixed use development has to be affordable. But because there isn't a definition in Chapter 117, I think it doesn't need to be affordable. And so this is reframing the sentence so that it's affordable housing, some of which could be a mixed use development. So I think it's reframing it so that affordable is first, make sure it's affordable, even if it's a mixed use development which I suspect was the intent originally, but again, this was a proposal that I took from proposed language, but um, if you'd like to change it or define mixed use, you can. So, um, other thoughts on this? Representative Stevens. I, I prefer the language as it had been in the last go around. Success comments about I represent Bogdan's comments about the goal to really try to address affordable housing in the state. And I hear the concern about unintended consequences, but I would hope maybe there would be one of those and the rest of them we'd actually see go up. Representative Sakovic. Yeah, I, I guess I would just make the same point I made about density that. There's no obvious connection between how much it costs 
to live in a place and how high it should be. So you know, if we think that communities can make buildings higher, you know, given the reasons why they may or may not do so, and that they're making that mistake, then we should tell them that they need to make higher buildings in, in general. And I, it just seems like there's a real disconnect between what that, that said, just fo focusing on, a, on affordable housing that, oh, if you're affordable, you get to go higher. Um, just, I just don't see how it makes sense. If we think that towns can go higher, then they should go higher everywhere and not just for this particular particular kinds of housing. There's good reasons to keep buildings at a certain height and we should keep them at that height. Yeah, one thing I know that comes up with going up is additional need for fire, like a, um, ladder trucks. And, and I, I wonder about how this relates to having, what, does it do something to our communities that, that again, we don't, I'm not foreseeing. We do have Representative Morris who's on the fire department, right? I, I, I agree with that uh, assumption that you just uh, outlaid there. It was uh, some communities don't have access to a lot of trucks, platforms, et cetera. <clears throat> Is there any ramifications to that, Ellen? Like if, are we, are we creating, are we telling towns they then have to have a ladder truck or could they then say we can't do multiple units? Unit floors. We don't have the capacity to do that fire protection. It does say it has the end building fire and safety codes, but you can meet code by buying a ladder truck. I mean, you could meet the requirements. And so are we telling towns they have to buy a ladder truck to do this? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could we just put a provision in there that leaves it up to the town and that the, they have the capacity to do that or not? Or in, in the, to, to, to build as high as they can based on what their capacities are as having the, the fire equipment necessary? And it may already have that in there with okay. um, fire building safety code. I just don't know if yeah. we're telling them they have to do it. So you're talking dollars for How do we get the answer to that question? So, the, so uh, Damien in our office handles fire code um, or perhaps the division of fire and building safety could uh, speak to it. Uh, it is my understanding the fire code itself applies to individual structures, not the town. So that's all I'm going to say. I don't, I can't. Right. <laughs> the fire code is a very complicated thing that I only slightly am aware of. I think I'm going to maybe just say if you could talk with Damien and sort of work on an answer about so what was can you rephrase can you restate your question i guess i'm wondering is if we're sort of you know we're saying you you you, you will do this you know <coughs> increase the density and that's gonna push a building up higher i know that i don't know what the height is but above a certain height you need a different truck to help to evacuate the building are we then then pushing another cost onto the town and saying you got to go buy that truck or can they say sorry we don't have the truck can't build that high in our town. That's my question. Representative Logan. Um, could we also state that no, um, no area in no area served by municipal sewer water infrastructure that allows residential development um, that they can decrease their building height limitations as a result of this legislation? but could also um, be exempt in, in the case like you just mentioned, um, exceeding their current height. Could say that probably. Yeah. Just to get at that 
concern about lowering building height limitations in order to represent a box. Yeah, just so the concept here is that again, the, these are areas served by sewer and water, so the buildings would be built to go to sprinkle. Sprinkle doesn't get people out. That's the testimony we took. I did. That might go back to the fire codes. Maybe we can get an answer to that question. Just for full disclosure, there are buildings and towns with uh, that don't have a lot of trucks yeah. that uh, they're difficult to get to already. Yeah. Since now, I don't want to build. I mean, I, I think there's probably a lot of towns that have pretty small fire departments as well. You know, when we're thinking about apparatus needed to fight fires. Some don't like, have big fires. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can we not? Page five. <laughs> Page five. Subsection 15 um, establishes the process by which towns can establish areas served by sewer, water and sewer infrastructure. At the very least, in the next draft, I think I should make sure that all of the phrases sewer and water or water and sewer are the same because I was inconsistent in my drafting. So, I would like to flag that for myself, but <laughs> and I thought that I did that before it was on the Senate, but it was a long day. So on page five, so as used in the section, an area served by municipal water and sewer infrastructure means there are two categories here. First, that residential connections and expansions are available to municipal water and direct and indirect discharge wastewater systems and not prohibited by state regulation or <clears throat> permits, identified capacity constraints, or municipally adopted service and capacity agreements. And so that's kind of a default provision um, that the town has connections and expansions available that aren't constrained by those identified constraints. Or areas established by the municipality by ordinance or bylaw that, and then it gives, these are the parameters that the uh, municipality can identify in their bylaw or ordinance. So uh, that exclude flood hazard or inundation areas as established by statute, river corridors or fluvial erosion areas as established by statute, shorelands, areas within a zoning district or overlay district, which purpose is natural resource protection, and wherever year-round residential development is not allowed. Uh, this hasn't gone. Has this? This hasn't gone to the editor. Has it? No, it hasn't gone to editing. No. Sorry. This feels funny. Well, it was <clears throat> the proposed language was whose purpose is yeah. and whose isn't the right word either. So I was trying which. Yes. Got it. I'll ask the editors. The purpose of which is maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and there's a typo on page one also. So yes, I will. Yes, there will be editing. All right. So also um, they can include, uh, they can reflect identified service limits established by state regulations or permits, identified capacity constraints or municipally adopted service and capacity agreements. They can exclude areas served by water and sewer to address an identified community scale public health hazard or environmental hazard. They can exclude areas serving a mobile home park that is not within an area planned for year-round residential development. They can exclude areas serving an industrial site or park. They can exclude areas where service lines are located to serve the areas described above, three, three, for five, three through five, which are the ones I just read, but no connections or expansions are permitted. <coughs> They can exclude areas which, through an approved planned unit development under Section 44.17 uh, of this title or transfer of development rights under this title, 
prohibit year round development or modify the zoning provisions allowed under this chapter in areas served by indirect discharge designed for less than 100,000 gallons per day. So that is providing flexibility to decide what these areas consist of based on these constraints. And then B says that municipally adopted areas served by municipal water and sewer infrastructure that limit water and sewer connections and expansions will not result in the unequal treatment of housing by discriminating against a year-round residential use or housing type otherwise allowed in this chapter. So um, they can adopt areas that are based on this list of things that are, are um, smaller areas, so long as they're not doing it to discriminate against housing. Um, so the language that's on page six that's highlighted. Before we go, let's just oh, well, try to understand that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Something about to say. Was, I thought you were going to the next that. page. I'm oh, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. So I'm I, sorry. Yeah, let's just skip over this whole section because it's right. very clear to everyone what was what is going on. <laughs> so back on page six, the new language that's being added here was proposed by South Burlington, I believe, um, because they do use planned unit development and transfer of development rights. Um, to prohibit year-round development in certain areas. Um, so that was a proposal from them. Um, and then, as I mentioned on the prior page, there's also the, the language that's being added about um, overlay districts that I mentioned a minute ago need some gra grammar work, but yes, overlay districts for natural resource protection. Zoning district or overlay district. Yes. And that language came from a couple places, including the NRC and probably South Brown. So uh, there is a lot of information in this section. Um, I will, I can explain the uh, Senate, <coughs> the Senate's intent, um, and then you can have further discussion because I think you received some other proposals. The Senate was interested in giving towns some flexibilities, um, particularly if they have identified constraints, if they have permits. Um, that limit their water supply, or if they have already um, established sharing agreements with other towns or specific situations. Um, so because this, this set of language in subsection 15 refers to the area early, the areas earlier in this bill that are being mandated to increase density. So um, this, these provisions on page five and six give the town some flexibility to define those areas for themselves based on a limited set of criteria um, that involve constraints. And it is a limited set of criteria um, so that towns cannot intentionally discriminate against housing types they don't like. Um, but you can choose to make other decisions and expand the list or shrink the list or, or make other changes if you'd like. And do you, um, I think we discussed just sort of the structure of this section. I mean, I, I've gone through it a few, enough to understand it and I'm comfortable with it, but I didn't know if you were had sort of editorial suggestions that would improve it. Make it so, first or second time reader to understand it. <laughs> um, well, I have considered whether it should just be in the definition section. Um, it's currently in this section of the bill because this is where it, this is, I believe, the only section that it's actually being used in. So it's close to the areas of law where it's being used. Um, it could go into the definition section. Um, you potentially could, I think the list potentially is a little redundant. I think it reflects the concept of capacity constraints multiple times. Um, so you could potentially come up with different ways to phrase that if you'd like. Um, You're reminding me because under large, like Roman numeral one and two, state regulations or permits and then identified capacity constraints, which may be redundant. That's clarifying maybe. Um, well, and so, I think that it reflects a couple. So I think that almost everything that's included in here came from specific testimony. And so I think the, a, a big picture thing is that I am not the sewer attorney. And this is a section of law specific to zoning, not attempting to impact how municipalities actually administer 
their sewer and water programs and physically administer their permits. It's asking to for the municipalities in their zoning to bring in some of the concepts related to that, but not impacting how they actually administer their, their wastewater systems um, in that way. And so that's why it's a little unusual because it's it's we're talking about zoning, but we're talking about a concept of law that is much broader zoning and may have a lot of different aspects to it, depending on the town and depending on the type of system they actually use in that town. Yeah. And so, oh, and so you were just asking, so I think that there was testimony that some towns may have state permits that they're working under, but other towns don't have state permits and they maybe <clears throat> have identified internally constraints in their system and there isn't necessarily a permit to back that up or, or anything like that so i think all towns have if you have a wastewater facility you have a state permit right but i'm not sure if all of those permits if there are constraints under those permits that would prohibit density specifically yeah and actually i think the testimony from rutland maybe is partly they may not have they have capacity constraints based on the cost of increasing service to certain areas of town. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's, let's leave this section. Do folks have further questions on it? Yeah, Representative Bongard. I, I want to talk a little bit about the section of yellow, um, what it actually translates to. So, um, I know it came from South Burlington. So, I am not entirely sure if this is necessary. I think there are two sections under title and under chapter 117, section 4417, and then section 4423 that give towns the options to use these two types of um, regulatory programs, um, planned unit development, which is a permitting process, and then transfer of development rights. And um, so towns have the ability to use that. I don't Think that anything in this bill currently is impacting that, but I, I think there was concerns from the city of South Burlington who uses both of those provisions a lot that they have outlined under those two programs areas where they are prohibiting year round residential development. And it was unclear to them if those areas that have been already prohibited from residential development would then have to be subject to this increased development requirement. So I'm not sure that I entirely agree with their assessment. However, I'm actually not super well versed, especially in transfer of development right, um, the mechanisms for that. So, uh, so the key language here is really areas that prohibit year-round development, residential development. Why do we say year-round as opposed to just residential? Because it could be a camp, could be a hunting camp. Yes. So I'm thinking about a place like South Burlington. Right. So, please. so I'm just wondering whether there's, there's, there's yeah. a, a lot. I mean, they may uh, still have camps in South Burlington. Just, <laughs> yeah, it was just a, a But the real key here is that they can do this if it's an area where year-round residential development is not allowed. Yeah. Those are just two mechanisms for doing it. So, yeah. Okay. So, I understand it. Okay. Representative Stevens. So, building off of trying to figure out what this language does, um, is this sort of, we've received a lot of emails um, from South Burlington residents, um, some saying we should be allowing more housing in the Southeast area, some saying we've worked really hard on our zoning process, we've done a lot in this area, we're continuing to, is this language pertaining to that sort of dialogue or is that somewhere else? Um, yeah. Go ahead. I, I would just say I don't, I wasn't here for most of the testimony, so I'm not sure. My sense is this is actually like natural resource areas that were identified in their planning process. And I don't know that specific southeast i don't necessarily mean the southeast i mean sort of the at the very core of this bill is where should we build and where shouldn't we and 
if if this language is related to those two sets of emails we've been getting, I just need to spend more time on this language. I really need. I guess what I would say is this language is from their chair of their select board or city council. I think it's um, and their planner. And that they may be in the midst of their own internal discussion about that stuff, but I don't think we should worry about wading into it. So you've heard from their elected officials and their staff. Trying to respect that and let them have their own conversation about the rest of it. To the extent it impacts the rest of the state. And what we're trying to do with statewide goals, I think we should talk about. Other thoughts on this? Yep, still thinking. That's good. Yeah, okay. Let's move on. Okay, page seven, section three. Section three has changes related to emergency shelters, which you will recall are homeless shelter, home uh, shelter for the homeless. Um, so it's adding it to the list of um, uses that towns can only regulate a subset of um, criteria on. And so there aren't any changes here. Oh, okay, that's that was my question. We're just talking, we're walking through the whole, whole, whole thing. Whole. Talked about it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, additionally, on page eight, still related to this topic, is that it's it again um, defines daily and seasonal hours of operation as um, part of the intended functional use. So again, that's something else the towns can't um, interfere with. Uh, on this for emergency shelters. Questions on this section? Okay. So on page eight, the next section is section four, the definition section. And so the only change here is the definition of accessory dwelling unit, which is identical to the language that is currently existing in 4412E. And so it reads an accessory dwelling unit means a distinct unit that is clearly subordinate to a single family dwelling and has facilities and provisions for independent living, including sleeping, food preparation, and sanitation, provided there is also provided there is compliance with all of the following. The property has sufficient wastewater capacity. The unit does not exceed 30% of the total habitable area of the single family dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. <clears throat> and so that language hasn't changed. It's just being moved here. Yeah. Okay. All right. On uh so that yeah, so the other definitions that are in this section are duplex, emergency shelter, and multi-unit or multi-family dwelling. And those have not changed um since the bill came over. So on page nine, the next section is section five. Um, this section 4441 is related to the um, report that towns have to make uh, to the Department of Housing and Community Development when they uh, update or add bylaws. They have to submit information to the department. And so, um, so there are no changes in this section in this draft. Um, they do have, but the towns are required to um, demonstrate conformity with sections 44, 12, 13, and 14, which are the first three sections of this bill. So they'll have to demonstrate how they're conforming with, with the changes that are being made in this bill, but also the other language that's in those statutes. And then they'll also have to provide information on how they um, what process the town uses for their um, their bylaw adoption, their administration, and their appropriate municipal panels, and that will, um, information will be um, go 
going into the municipal planning and data center perspective use for a statewide zoning atlas. And so this language also has not changed in this draft. I, I have some language that came from the planners, I believe, here. It would replace I and two on starting on page 14. I'm sorry, line 14. What page? Uh, page 10. Um, but I think getting at the same thing, but um, so say above it, on adoption or amendment of a bylaw, the planning commission shall prepare an adoption report in form and content provided by the Department of Housing and Community Development. That, and um, I have some language I'd like us to think about that with, it says, confirms that zoning districts GIS data has been submitted to the Department of Housing and Community Development and that the data complies with Vermont zoning GIS data standard adopt, adopted pursuant to 10 BSA section. 123 and then new two confirms actually can we continue new two but then then two would move down to three confirms that the complete bylaw has been uploaded to the municipal plan bylaw database this this goes to some of the questions that the chair was asking early on about what do we actually know about what's everywhere what's everywhere and this is about getting that information uploaded and accessible so that Next time we're looking at this, we actually have a lot of that stuff for our fingertips. So it's just about GIS and uploading bylaws. What is it? Oh, and then three, you have to keep going, I think, because then the other two become demonstrates conformity and then provides information. Oh, it's an insertion of a new one and two, and the others get renumbered to three and four. And so I would just add, um, I think I'd have to double check, but I think that's those two subsections were in seven economic developments version, and then um, they actually took them out. Senate economic development took them out. Yeah. Any recollection as to why? Yes. <laughs> there was specific concern um, about town's capacity yeah. to upload data. That the complete bylaw has been. Yeah. Yeah. And they, um, <laughs> yes. You say? There's, yes. Uh, I was trying to be vague, but I do recall the, the, the d discussion very clearly about um, whether towns have internet, yeah. whether they have staff who know how to upload and use the database. So they were very sort of specific questions about how to use the database that it would be required under that language. And they took more testimony from John Adams. I looked at it yesterday. <clears throat> um, it's worth looking at his testimony that was in their committee. Representative Bongars. I mean, couldn't they just take their bylaws to the regional commission and have them upload them? I, I can't imagine that's possible. Well, and we're in the midst of a, you know, GIS, you know, parcel mapping project that's reaching every every town at some point. Oh, um, okay. Did you have something to add, Mr. Cocker? Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Cocker from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, to confirm that when this question came up in the Senate, the RPC has indicated that they would help any town getting any assistance via internet, doing forms during the process because. Um, without this information being uploaded, we can't really get the clarity on what's allowed in communities. And if this bill passes, a lot of zoning is going to change. So the, the zoning map we're, we're currently building will be stale in two years because everything has changed. So it's really critical that we create a procedure and process to collect this data. And any town needing assistance will be assistance will be provided by the regional organizations. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm okay putting that in the next version. Not seeing any other questions about it. Uh, 
um, page 11. So section six is about appeals in the municipal system, uh, the municipal planning system, so including zoning and planning. And so um, none of the language on page 11 is changing. Um, and it lists the people currently allowed to appeal. Uh, the changes are on page 12. And so this bill has been proposing to change um, subsection four, which establishes that any 10 persons who are um, voters or real property owners in municipality can appeal. Um, and so this version is, uh, uh, and so as it came over from the Senate, it was changing it to say, um, any 10 persons with a common injury to a particularized interest protected by the chapter could appeal. And this is, um, uh, has similar intent, So, but it's changing it further. So on page 12, any person aggrieved as defined in 8502F, uh, 85027 um, can appeal. For purposes of the subdivision, a particularized interest shall not include the character of the area affected if the project has a residential component that includes affordable housing. So the Senate version did include this part about particularized interest not including character of the area, um, and that uh, is being narrowed to only apply to affordable housing. And I will say that the definition of a grieved person is actually being added on the next page. So, uh, although it's very similar. So, so on page 13, a person aggrieved means a person who alleges an injury to a particularized interest protected by the provisions of law listed in 8503 of this title or uh, 24 VSA chapter 117, which is the, the zoning chapter we've been looking at, attributable to an act or decision by a district coordinator, district commission, secretary, or uh, an appropriate municipal panel or the environmental division that can be redressed by the environmental division or the Supreme Court. So this is showing that currently this definition of person of grief, aggrieved, which uses the definition of particularized interest um, is what's currently being used for Act 250 and a and &R appeals. And so it's adding that this also be the standard of appeal for municipal decisions regarding planning and zoning. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. So I thought not having been on the Senate side, my understanding of Part of why it was 10 persons with shared interest was to really make it so that there was less of one person showing up saying, I don't want this because I'm going to see this or whatever. This to me feels like, and, and frankly, many of the components that we've talked about this morning feel to me like we are walking away from the substantive meaningful changes that were in S100. And I guess when it came to us. And I guess for my question here, doesn't this sort of just go back to where we're at currently? We're like one person. No, I'm misunderstanding this. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah. I, um, right now it's just any persons, any 10 persons. Yeah. So you don't have to have a threshold showing of particular last interest. Um, and this the way it can work from the Senate, when 10 people with a, effectively a particularized interest, it would make it, in many cases, almost impossible to appeal. And so I, think, I actually agree with this language and, and actually, I think like, um, and I think lining it up with 250, you do have to make a showing. The first question is, do you actually have a particularized interest? It's not that you just get to say it, you don't like it. So it isn't just one person being able to appeal. It is somebody because you know this does get then to a you know a deep philosophical discussion. Um, and as you know, I don't like nimbyism or anything else or less, but I do think that you have to have a viable means for appeal 
But I do believe you have to be able to make that particular pitch, was just like you do in an active case or an agency appeal. And it makes sense that they're consistent to me. So it isn't, it's actually easier to get any 10 with no, that's easy. Um, because under the existing system, because they don't have to have a particular interest in just 10. And here it's saying you must have a particular interest, even though it's one. The Senate saying 10 with effectively the use of slightly different language with a particular interest could actually make it virtually impossible to, because you might not have that um, to be even the neighbor. And I do believe you have to have viable appeal rights because you battle people, sometimes they're right. So I, I actually like this language, lining it up with 250 and what you need for the agency. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, it makes it easier for one person to complain. A lot. Of, it's a lot easier than, than 10 to get together and have the same issue. Uh, shouldn't it be two or three at least? It's a hard question because it may be that only one person has the particularized interest. Um, or you may not like the person that's building. Well, that that wouldn't stand up because the threshold question of the court would be to prove the particularized interest. In fact, you don't like somebody wouldn't do it. So um, I think that's, I mean, feel feel free to modify anything I've said as you, as you want to, but... Um, so, yeah, so this is the legal concept known as standing and defining who has the ability to bring a lawsuit, to appeal a decision. Um, it is a big question. Um, so I would just say, yes, yeah, so the, even though the words are a little bit different in this draft, I do think the primary difference here than what is in the Senate version is the 10 number of people, as well as the mentioning of affordable housing, but um, they had used particularized interest. And so this draft is using that in slightly different words, but um, yes, currently under municipal um, planning, appeals can be by any person, any 10 persons, and they don't need to have the particularized interest, which is a threshold question to get your appeal. Um, to, to get status to bring the appeal. It, it seems to me that this is kind of in the middle. It's sort of it's uh, splitting the difference more than just going from one extreme to another. Let me just give an example. Something's being built with a parking lot that slopes onto your property, and you really don't want the slope. Watch one to your you are the person with a particular interest that, that wouldn't be ten. If you require to have a particular interest, that person would have no appeal rights. And so, um, but the court's not sympathetic. Also, you got to prove standing. And it's not just, I don't like the development, that won't work. <laughs> it's got to, you have to really prove a particular interest. And then, and yet if we make it 10, it's very often virtually impossible for that person with an actual alleged injury to be able to, they, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And this does, by the way, before we're done here, if I'm right, we end up saying this can't be <coughs> character of the area as it relates mm -hmm. to housing. That's in there. So we'll for uh, housing with affordable. Just point that out because that's the usual nifty tool. Yeah. And this is taking that away, which right. is also right. limiting it. Also uh, limiting it. Oh, you can't appeal on that. So that. Representative Sibelia. Yeah, I appreciate that second, the secondary addition there of that language, but I am concerned about the um, one person. Um, and I, I understand on 10, um, but, you know, how, how are the courts working on it these days? Um, you know, what is the cost that is associated here? So, you know, yes, they may be, they may be um, fine going to court. How long is that going to take? How much is that going to take? You know, can't we up the bar a little bit more than just one? Could we make it two or three? Just to play this out, the problem with that is that it may be one person who has that particular interest only, and um, the second person wouldn't have it. And so we are, I think the chair is right about this, that this really is a 
middle ground. Any 10 is easy. Like you can do that anytime you want. You can get 10. If it's just without any without uh, any particularized. Showing. Yeah, that's interest. the old. That's the old. This that's is actually harder. Okay. Um, but it is possible. And by the way, to go to your point about expense and everything, there's a threshold showing before you, you don't go through the whole court process. You go through the threshold question of do you actually have standing? Do you actually have a particular interest? Then you go to court effectively. Um, so anyway. I think you have to have this, otherwise people are going to. It's going to happen that some people are treated unfairly uh, because you, they are going to, uh, I just picked that example up in my head, but there's others um, that can get visited on. The, the real effects can get visited on you. Or we'll have to decide whether what you're complaining about rises to the level of a particular interest to therefore stand there. I want to be sure that um, we, we did take testimony Office of Racial Equity, that, that the original language was has been struck, didn't necessarily cover a renter. I, I just want to make sure that this one would, the way it's written now, if you were a renter who's had a particularized interest next to it, but you'd still could, could have particularized interests and have standing. Yes. All right. Um, members, it's lunchtime. Oh, Representative Logan. Well, occupying property. I'm trying to think, see where renters have cause. Well, the other one limited it to certain people, and this one doesn't. So well, the existing law only says uh, it, it's not necessarily renters specifically. It's renters who can't vote. Is that the limit? Well, so we limited it to voters or property owners, and that right. could be not non-voting, non-property owning neighbor. Right. Yeah. So this, but this eliminates that language. Okay. Um, I want to be aware of the time. We just did a long stretch. Thank you, everyone. Um, time to break for lunch. We're on the floor at one, and then we are back with Ellen at ten minutes after the floor to continue this.